All right, there's a chain of logic that you have to pay attention to when we're talking sovereignty. Okay? Now, I want to emphasize a couple of things here. Wise men are instructed by reason. Okay? Everybody read this okay? That's large enough, right? Wise men are instructed by reason, men of lesser, less understanding by experience, the most ignorant by necessity, and the beast by nature. That was by Cicero in, a letter, in his letter to Atticus. And in order to make this stuff work, you absolutely must be instructed by reason. It's difficult to find cases to support your point, your sovereign point of view. So you have to take what you see, put two and two together, and on your own figure out it's four. Okay? The very first order I ever issued in a case was not my case. The sovereign of the court, the sovereign was in jail. He had moved for habeas corpus in the Superior Court. The, um, uh, the Superior Court judges just uh, overruled him, didn't recognize his habeas corpus, which was handwritten because he was in jail. He was being held in jail by the uh, Municipal Court. So what he did was, by sovereign authority, since he had already created his court with the habeas corpus, Superior Court, he appointed me as a special master in his court. Now, a special master is basically, in this sense, is a judge without the pay. Okay? He gave me blanket authority to do a number of tasks, and so I was going to start performing them. And I started researching the case and so forth, but I filed a copy of the special master appointment. Now, understand that we had no precedent. But, according to our research, if he's the sovereign of the court, if it's his court, he can appoint anybody to staff his court, right? You know, if necessary, he could appoint a court jester, okay? In, in this case, I'm my own court jester. But, <laughs> that's why I wear the hat. <laughs> but, you see, he appointed me as a special master. And I had the authority to investigate, to, to uh, take, to take uh, testimony, and so on. So I started working on the case. Well, while I was working on the case, there was a jailhouse rumor that he was going, his, his uh, case was going to come up for some sort of hearing the following Monday. So I quick did some research as to what we could do there. And again, no present. All I knew was that I was a special master of the Superior Court and I was entitled to conduct hearings. So I went down to the, to the Municipal Court and uh, I met with the judge in chambers before he started his court sessions and I said to him, I understand that you're, you have this case. You know, I requested and I got a hearing and I was dressed looking like an attorney, by the way. You know, pinstripe suit, no beard, okay, proper tie. Vest. I actually had a vest. No crown. No crown. Right. Like I was a subject, right? And so I went. I went into the uh, into chambers, explained to him that uh, I'd been appointed a special master in the superior court. I understood that this case was coming up for hearing, and I was I, I was here to observe the proceedings. Well, anyway, it got to be a little more fun after that because the prosecutor came in and started talking about the case ex-party know I was there in my capacity. He thought I was, he took one glance. He said, oh, fellow attorney, you know. So he's talking to the judge. But he started talking about this case, which is absolutely illegal, of course, for him to do. You know, the judge was no dummy. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. He says, this is getting too complicated. We need to go on the record. He cut it off, okay? But of course, if we had chosen, we could have prosecuted the prosecutor for that. Anyhow, we didn't, but... We went out into the courtroom. When he called the case, I stood up, and on my left was the prosecutor. On my right was the public defender that had been appointed that he did not want, that the, the defendant did not want. 
And so when it came my turn to speak, and I, I'll tell you in retrospect, I was very lucky. Like, I had a very intelligent judge up there. He was far better educated than most municipal court judges. But at the time, I didn't know that. And so he said to me, he says, well, he says, uh, what do you want me to do? Well, I'm a special master in the court. I cannot instruct him what I want him to do as an individual. So I spoke regal language. Now, you understand, in regal language, the king never orders anything, right? He only wishes for things. In regal language, um, you speak in the third person. The king never says I. He himself refers to the king when he means himself. Okay? So I, and, and since I was on borrowed authority, because I was not in sovereign capacity, I was in a, uh, a master of the court capacity. So I said to him, well, I said, uh, I am William Thornton, and I've been appointed a special master in the Superior Court of the State of California, and I am here to observe the proceedings in this municipal court case, and I'm here now declaring this, the Superior Court of the State of California open and in session. And so then uh, we started talking back and forth a little bit, and I said that uh, it appeared that there were some uh, uh, common law rights that were at stake here, and uh, the judge immediately informed me that, well, the common law had no standing in this court. And so I informed him that uh, I said yes, I said that's, you're absolutely right, Your Honor. I agree that, that it has no standing. However, in Miranda versus Arizona, the court said that where substantive rights are at stake, there shall no, not be any rulings, any rules that would abrogate them. Okay? So, he agreed. That's right. He knew the, the Miranda case. Okay? Everybody's heard that read your rights case. Well, that's a nice part of the case, but the real thing about the case is that they can't make any rules either for or against your rights. Rights stand on their own. So he acknowledged that. We're dealing with substantive rights. So we paused for a moment. This is a little war story here. We paused for a moment, collecting our thoughts, I guess, and the prosecutor stood up and she said, Your Honor, who is this man? <laughs> I don't know who he is. I don't know what he's doing here. The judge just stared her down. He didn't say anything. She finally sat down, frustrated. <laughs> and then he turned back to me and he started speaking and what he said had absolutely nothing to do with what she had to say. It was the greatest act of discourtesy I've ever seen a judge commit against a prosecutor. You know, I mean, normally these folks are very close. Well, my knees were shaking up until that point and then I realized I had something here. Here I am, a third party invader, and he's giving me full attention. Okay? Something's going, I must have figured some of my theory was right here. So I proceeded. And he said, so he asked me, what is it that you want me to do? And I said, well, it is the wish of the Superior Court that the Municipal Court release jurisdiction of this matter to the Superior Court until such time as the issues in the Superior Court are settled. And he, and he said, I will do that if you will give me the order in writing. Now I went personal in my conversation. Back to me. I said, well, I came prepared with half an order, Your Honor. I said, I didn't know how things would go, but if you will recess the case, I will complete the order and be, be ready when you recall the case. And he said, okay. And so that's what he did. He recessed it. And then I rushed all over, you know, I wrote it out real fast, and then I rushed all over finding a copy machine, getting copies made, you know, and came back. So when, later on in the day, when he called the case, I then gave it to the marshal, he passed it up to the judge, the judge read it into the record, and then he ordered the, the order to be filed into the case. And then that was the end of that session that day. Okay? So that's how we, we did it. That was sovereignty in action. But the thing that i got to understand is that we arrived at this purely because of a reasoning process. Okay? Purely because of that. We said if 
A is true and B is true, it must follow we got the authority. Now, not everybody likes to think. And this is tough. Uh, how many times have you heard somebody say, do you have an example of this? Have you ever, you know, can you show me any case law? You ever heard anybody say, you don't have anything unless you got a case to support it? I've heard that. Okay, not true. Not true. There are priorities. The highest law is the common law. Okay, the Constitution is under the common law. The, con the Constitution recognizes the common law too. And, it, and you can see in the Seventh Amendment, when you have a, a, a case at law, no decision by a jury is reviewable in any court. That's what it says right in the Constitution, in the Seventh Amendment, other than by the rules of the common law. And what do the rules of the common law say? Well, basically what it says is that if a jury makes a decision, the only way you can beat that is with another jury. But the Supreme Court has no authority to touch it. Now, if you're wondering why judges cancel out certain juries' decisions, it's because those were not real juries. Those were advisory juries. That's another situation. Yes, sir. Bill, a question. Can legal maxims which are based upon the common law be used? If you decree them so, sure. See, you have to decree it. Make it the law of the case and you betcha. Yeah. Right. It's not, in fact, anything. You know, I have a law. I, I'm, some of you have heard about this already. I have a law that, that is my own creation. And that is that nobody is allowed to wear pink shoes in my presence. And I take this very seriously because there's a death penalty associated with the violation of that law. Okay? Now, I have to acknowledge, because of the impact of reality, I have to acknowledge that it would be very difficult for, if the, if the defense were to invoke a jury, it would be difficult for me to get a jury to accept that law. Okay? But they don't understand my background. Okay, I think it's a reasonable law, but I acknowledge that most jurors would not find it reasonable. So what most jurors would do, because remember, the, the job of a juror is twofold. They judge the facts, right? They also judge the law. And if they don't, if they don't like the law, they can throw it out. Jury nullification, right? So the probability is I have yet to achieve a single conviction, by the way. But, you know, and that may have something to do with it. But now you turn it around. Let's say I have another law which is that if I'm, the, basically the law operates this way. If I'm walking down the street, totally minding my own business, and a total stranger comes from behind me and strikes me and injures me, I think that person should pay for all the medical bills and that person should maybe go to jail for 30 days, okay, at least. And if I bring charges that way, it could be in civil, could be, he can be put in civil jail, Okay, not necessarily criminal, but if I bring charges, I suspect that most jurors would roll with that one. Okay, but the law comes from the sovereign. You decree it. That makes it the law of the case. If you don't decree it, you don't have the law. Now, if you fail to decree it, then what happens is that the uh, maybe the judge might invoke it. I don't know. You know, it, it, it's or whatever. You know, they work it out. But that, that's for people who don't understand they're in charge. But if you're in charge, you must decree what the law is before you can run the rest of your case. All right, but where do you find this law? Well, you make it up. But I try to make my law, with the exception of the pink shoe law, I try to make my laws pretty well meet the existing pattern of statutory law. I borrow their wording but it's my authority that makes it a go. Okay? That's why it said, you saw it there, the law of this case is decreed as follows. And my signature is at the bottom of the paper. Okay? So that, that's where the law comes from. But you have to be instructed by reason. If you want an example for everything you do, believe me, this is not going to work for you. 
All right, it won't work. You've got to be able to say, be able to reason the process out. If A is so, B is so, then C must be so. And if you're not good at that, then don't try this stuff because it isn't going to work for you. All right, this is a thinking person's system. This is not a fill-in-the-blank system. Not at this point. I'm working on it, okay? Give me a few months, I may have something that, that will help in that department. But right now, it's a thinking person system. Okay, understand this, running quickly through it. Language and dictionaries. In America, we speak three languages. Okay, street English is one of them. Second one is formal English that you learned in school. And this is the language that most attorneys use. And then there's the language of the court. That is the third English language which is not taught. Okay? If you want to know what a word means, go to the, the set of books called Words and Phrases. It's in most, most law libraries have it. And, or if you don't have that, if you have access to the internet, and you should have access to the internet if you're going to play the game, it's one of the tools of war. Okay? This is, this is civil, going to court basically is civilized warfare. Okay? And even though you're friendly to the opposition, you're not, they're not your friend, you're not their friend. Okay? And, but, if you're on the internet, you can search cases for certain words because sometimes they argue over those words. And you'll find out what they really mean. But you can go to the set of books called Words and Phrases. You can also go to Case Law and look up words under Case Law. And um, also there's uh, uh, American Jurisprudence. There's one, uh, Roman numeral one, two, and three. Okay, there's three sets now, I think. It's up to Amjur uh, th third. Uh, you can look up words there. Because the legal meaning of a word may be different from the popular meaning of a word. Uh, the most obvious example is the word democracy. Everybody I've talked to, when they, when they say the word democracy using their normal day-to-day -day formal English, they really mean a republic. You know, they, you ask them what a democracy and they describe it to you, it pretty much is a, a republic. Um, I made a talk recently before another group, a political group actually, um, and, and uh, they had big signs all over it said democracy on it. You know, I had big ones. They, they're pushing big on democracy. It wasn't the Democratic Party either. And, uh, and so I pointed out to them this fact that we speak three languages and I said, what, I know what you mean, but don't use that word when you go to court because it has an entirely different meaning in court. And then I explained it to them, and I got them all converted over. They understood that it was fine when they're in the popular, it's fine for the posters, but don't ever bring that into court, because a democracy and a republic are two different things. So understand that, that there's a different language spoken in the courtroom. The way I, I started, and I'm surprised every day at things I thought I knew what they meant, okay? But when I started, when I first realized that the legal language was a separate language, even though it was still called English, and I started studying as it such, what I did was I started with the Constitution. And it said, we the people, etc. And I looked up we, and I looked up the, <laughs> and I looked up people. I just proceeded, it was to me, I pretended it was a brand new language and I didn't know what the word meant, and I went to the legal dictionaries and to the words and phrases set of books and so forth to find out what these words mean. It's pretty shocking sometimes. You know? Resident. Okay, there's another one that you, you're familiar with. Okay? Resident in everyday language, yeah, it means, you know, you live here. But if, but if you're speaking legal language, the proper word is domicile. Okay? If you're domiciled here, you don't have to explain yourself. If you're a resident, that means you came from outside the jurisdiction and you're here for a specific purpose and when you accomplish it, you'll leave, go home. Okay, you'll leave the jurisdiction. So if you're a resident of California, you came from outside of California. I might ask you, uh, are you a citizen of the United States? If you say yes, well then obviously District of Columbia is your home. 
Okay, if you're a resident of California. That's why it is, you never see the word resident in, uh, I mean, you never see the word domicile in your legal papers. Driver's license application, right? Are you a resident of California? Well, they can't require driver's license of people who are domiciled. But if you're a resident, you cross sail over the border, you're a foreigner. Yeah, we got a question generating back here. Hot, so, okay. So, if you fail to leave the jurisdiction, then what happens? Well, I don't have that problem. I'm domiciled. I mean, I'm talking about anyone who wouldn't. Well, why would you claim you're a resident if you know you can Well, I'm domiciled? talking about the rest of the people, or yeah. the rest of the citizens, let's put it that way. Anybody else? I'm trying to get an alternate answer. Well, I, I'm telling you, don't be a citizen. <laughs> don't, be, don't be resident. Okay? Otherwise, you have to explain yourself. I don't explain myself. I'm one of the people. Okay? Don't, don't, don't let it get past the gate. Cut them off at the pass. If that question comes up, stay on point. Don't suddenly get off point on that. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah, but there's a whole bunch of other so-called people out there, and I just wanted to know what other thinking would be. Well, uh, it, it, look, it, it, the answer is very simple. <coughs> if you screw up, you get hurt. <laughs> okay? Even if you're ignorant. Those other people out there who wish to call themselves citizens and residents, uh, they're not here being educated on the point. Okay? Can't deal with those people. Yes, sir? Is my understanding that... Uh, if you say the words uh, United States citizen, that's different than saying citizen of the United States. Well, I, 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 there, there's a, the question is, is that is there a difference uh, between citizen of the United States and uh, United States citizen? And first of all, the United States citizen is a phrase that I have not found in the legal literature. But... What I have found in the Constitution, it defines what a citizen of the United States is. And so, that's the language I use. I stay with constitutional language and I don't get off point. So, United States citizen or citizen of the United States doesn't apply because I'm, in my cases that I'm involved in, I'm always one of the people of the United States or one of the people of California. Don't get off point. Remember, remember this. Our great leader, Abraham Lincoln, was an attorney. And he advised us that if you don't want to argue a point, don't bring it up. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. In the preamble, it says the word people, yes. citizen, is synonymous. It doesn't say that in the preamble. I just read it the other day. Well, not in the preamble. And it was a pre-1933... Uh, I'm sorry. You, if you're talking a case, that's one thing. If you're talking about the preamble of the Constitution, there is no word citizen in the Constitution in the preamble. I'll look it up again. You look it up. Okay. Yes. Uh, two days ago, I was watching on CNN a discussion uh, in a constitutional law and foreign law of uh, Justice uh, Scalia and uh, Breyer. Mm -hmm. And Scalia was saying that when he looks to the Constitution and the language of the Constitution, he always goes back to Britain and the laws and the language of, 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 of Britain. Sure. Because when the, when the founders were writing the Constitution, they weren't interpreting it, they were writing it, they were using the language of that day and the understanding of the language of that day. And that is what the justices are supposed to be doing in their courts. All right, if or you, in the courts. If you go on the internet, you can buy a computerized version of Webster's 1828 dictionary. And I use that frequently to get those original meanings. I have one in the car if you want to use it. Okay, it's good to know about. We don't, we don't need it, but yeah, it's good to know about. Uh, but yes, that, that is correct. The uh, um, fact... Let's just take a look here. Bill? Yes. Uh, I'm from Oregon, so... Sure. Then how does that work with uh, leaving after you're, uh, if you're a resident? 
if you're a non-resident? I don't see any difference. You know, if, if you wish to bring up the point that you're from Oregon, well, now you've got something to argue about. I wouldn't bring it up in the first place if I were local to California. If you're domiciled in California. He's not. He's domiciled in California. Well, no. Now that now there you see you can be domi you can only have one domicile, but you can have as many residences as you want. Okay. In fact, that issue came up with during one of the elections. Uh, somebody was running for presidential election, and they they said, "Hey, he's not resident in some place." Oh yeah, he had multiple residences, and he was resident. So yeah, you don't. Uh, you're running out of wire. Yeah. Don't pull. <laughs> Alright, so now, look, don't get distracted like I'm being distracted. Alright? <laughs> don't get distracted. You're bringing up bogus issues. Don't, you know, if, if you want to argue the point, sure, put it in your papers. But I find if I leave a lot of stuff out, it saves a lot of discussion. Okay? So don't, don't say you're a citizen of Oregon or you're from Oregon and, and they're, they're treating you unfairly because you're an outsider. Okay? You say you belong here. This, your domicile is right here. That, your domicile does not affect your residence. <clears throat> okay? All right. Yes, sir. Microphone. It was. If I claim to be of the people, can they use my past contracts as evidence to prove otherwise? In other words, they 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 may try to claim that I am a citizen. All right. If they if they wish to bring in a contract, all you do is you say, all right, show me show me the contract. All right. So let's say they do. I've never had them produce a contract, but let's say they do. They produce a contract. You read the terms of the contract. Where's your signature? Well, they say it's right here. You got a driver's license, or you got a social security card, or so forth. Well, and you're saying that that's the terms of the contract? They say, yeah. Well, I didn't know that. No. You knew that at the time I, I signed the contract? No you didn't disclose it to me? You knew that I would object? And you kept that hidden? Void from ab initio, right. Void contract, okay? Standard contract law. So, that's why I'm not concerned about contracts. But there's another important point. You can be a citizen for some purposes and not a citizen for other purposes, okay? And the option is purely yours. The only time they have general jurisdiction is when the person generally is a citizen, <laughs> okay? All right, so anyway, language is important, so be sure that you use the right language and get to know the legal language as a separate language, okay? So that instead of being bilingual, you should now be trilingual. Now, you're all bilingual, I know, because you, you know slang and you know formal English. Those are two languages right there, street English and formal English. Well, now you have to learn the third language, which is court English. Okay, now let's get into people or citizen. Which one are you? Because I'm going to beat this subject to death. The preamble, since you brought it up, we're going to talk about it. Let's go right down to it. 